This is an update in my continuing coverage of the third ever discovered interstellar object. Perhaps the most striking development is that 3i Atlas has turned green, and it's not entirely clear why. So the development of a green hue is fairly common in solar system comets as they get closer to the sun and warm up and start outgassing different compounds at different temperatures. Here a green color usually means dicarbon. However, 3i Atlas wasn't showing many signs of the presence of dicarbon, which is a further indicator that the chemistry of this object is very different from a solar system comet. However, there are other molecules that can impart a green hue, or it could just be that for some reason the C2 just wasn't detected, but is in fact there. That hint, though, of odd chemistry is one of things that make this object interesting because it really shows that it is not from these parts. An origin in the thick galactic disk remains the best option. In an age of about 7 billion years, however, this evidence isn't all that robust. It's circumstantial and it may in fact be older. So it's possible that we still don't know the origin or age. It's really more like an educated guess. But what that odd chemistry does do is give us a profile of the object's formation and history, and even where in its star system it most likely originated. In this case, some evidence exists that may suggest that the object formed near its star's carbon dioxide frost line relatively far out. And there are other odd things about the comet's chemistry, such as a rather off from the solar system ratio of iron and nickel, though that missing iron may yet be found. And the comet is also emitting cyanogen, which is a cyanide and highly toxic to us, but it's very common in comets. It also maintains an unusually large proportion of carbon dioxide, a finding from the James Webb Space Telescope, in fact, which also showed small amounts of waterous and vapor, carbon monoxide and carbonyl sulfide. The mix is actually sufficiently strange that it's been advanced that the object may be covered in a kind of crust, maybe water ice related, that is creating this profile somehow. The size of the comet's nucleus is still not well constrained, and there are questions about that. But data from the Hubble Space Telescope gives strong evidence for it being less than 5.2 kilometers possibly much less. The reason this is has been so difficult to nail down is that comets emit a coma. It's like being surrounded in a cloud. So it's very difficult to see the nucleus and, and separate that out from a huge glowing coma around it that's reflecting light. But there is a way to constrain that further. More on that in a bit. The comet is also now sporting a growing tail, and then there is a surprising discovery that a lot has been made of. Polarimetric observations done at several observatories, including the Very Large Telescope, Nordic Optical Telescope, and the Rosian Observatory in July and August, show that the object has a very high level of negative polarization at small phase angles. What this means is that a large quantity of the light reflected off of the object's coma have their oscillations oriented on the observer plane. This is actually the highest ever seen for a comet. But it is similar to certain trans-Neptunian objects and points to the coma being a mix of ice and dark material, which reddened material is normal for something that spent so much time in the interstellar medium. One interesting aspect to this is that this is actually the last time an object like this will be discovered in the manner that it was, because a number of telescopes actually spotted it, but it was not noticed. But a major one that did see it was the Vera Rubin Observatory which accidentally caught it during testing and it wasn't recognized due to it being in its testing phases. But it would have discovered the object if it had begun its science validation phase a mere two weeks before it actually did. Another one that caught it before its official discovery by the Atlas survey was the TESS spacecraft and could have done it as early as May. But TESS is an exoplanet survey and not really intended for comet hunting. The window for observing 3i Atlas from Earth is closing for the time being and we will not be able to see it from here when it makes its closest pass to the sun. After that, however, it will become visible again when it emerges from the glare of the sun. Mars can see it, however, during this period, and so can the probes there. A lot of people asked me why we weren't using Hubble and James Webb more extensively to look at 3i Atlas while we still can before it goes out of view. The answer is actually straightforward. It's so you don't burn the telescope's cameras out. So both Hubble and JWST are highly sensitive instruments. They are reflecting telescopes and they gather and concentrate very dim light like any reflector telescope does. This means that they can't be pointed anywhere near the sun due to its brightness and have large zones of exclusion where they cannot point. This is made up for by the fact that Earth orbits the sun. So you just do observations when you can see whatever object you want to observe in the deep sky. But it limits what can be done with comets. 
3 i is simply now within the exclusion zones of both instruments. As an odd aside, that prohibition actually has not stopped the Hubble telescope from doing measurements of the Sun. It actually can, but indirectly, and only very rarely, by looking at its light reflecting off the Moon, which lets it see the Sun's spectrum in reflected light. Earth and the Sun, though, they avoid. And also because Hubble is really designed for precision pointing at great distance, not fast-moving objects like the Moon or Earth. The Moon especially very rapidly goes out of Hubble's field of view, and it's just not equipped to track it very well. But there is always Mars, and here is where there is more news. For those hoping that some of the probes at Mars and elsewhere would swing around for observations, it has been confirmed by ESA that they will attempt observations with Mars, express in the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter around the time of the closest approach to the Mars. They also have planned observations with the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, known as JUICE, and also the object will pass through the field of view of SOHO, the ESA NASA Solar Heliospheric Observatory, but they caution that the object will probably be too faint to see with that instrument. There was talk of using the Juno spacecraft for a possible rendezvous, but it turns out that not only is Juno low on fuel, it also has problems with its engine, and just too near its end of lifetime to pull it off. And then there is MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this craft has actually been used to do measurements of comets before, so it's almost certainly going to do observations on 3 Atlas. And it's a good one. MRO's high-rise camera is actually a rather sizable telescope in its own right. Not unlike a spy satellite, and you can see the resolution it's capable of. This is Earth and the Moon taken by MRO at Mars. Regarding the suggestions of some of the other spacecraft in the solar system that in principle can do observations, the problem there is that doing so does not outweigh the original scientific missions of those probes. And just turning a spacecraft can involve high-risk maneuvers to take the observation. Also defining this is what instrument packages they have and whether any of it would be useful in this context. Now, back to Hubble and Webb. So the comet comes out of the zone of exclusion for Hubble in November and more observations are planned. For Webb, it won't be until December. Its zone is actually larger than Hubble's. And again, more observations are planned, so we can get a characterization of the object after it has passed its closest point to the Sun and see what changes have happened. 3i Atlas will make its closest approach to Mars on October 3rd and its closest pass to the Sun on October 29th. And after that, we'll come back into visibility from Earth with both ground and space-based telescopes. It will then dim over the coming year, and after a few months in the new year, will become unobservable by anything we have. But it should be enough to give us a solid handle on what this weird interstellar comet is like, what at least part of its history must have been, and what material of this nature was like potentially several billion years before our own solar system formed. And when the Vera Rubin Observatory begins full operations, it will very likely soon become clear that the adventure of studying interstellar objects has only just begun. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently watching the fall apocalypse of the vegetables. Gardening for the year is winding down, and time to start thinking about bringing the perennials in. Odd thing is, it's not long at all from now when it's time to start seeds. Strange how that goes, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.